How long have you been here at Elgin now, Graham? Elgin. Uh, I came up to 73. I was in the Air Force. Got involved with the football group. 80. Yeah. And how, how did that opportunity arise again? Here? Yeah. I ran a junior club called Bishop. I, well, I played for RAF Kinloss and I moved into Elgin. And when I moved into Elgin, I uh, I decided that travelling back as opposed to Kinloss wasn't, wasn't what I really wanted to do. So I got involved with a local junior club called Bishop United, managed them. And then after managing them, one of the managers of Elgin asked me to come and take his team to train. So I trained his team and, and he put me as assistant manager and then eventually I got as manager and then just bent up from there. How, how did you get on uh, when you were manager here? Um, okay, and won a cup and did all right. But it was it was very difficult at that time with the, um, the, the finances weren't great. So it was quite difficult. I managed Lossy as well. I'm going to manage Lossy. All right. I was never good enough to play. I'm just, I wasn't, uh, I wasn't good enough to play high in the league. I played junior, reasonable standard junior, played for select and that sort of thing, but I was never good enough to play for high in for Elgin. The two magic questions are how long furloughs were last and when do we start playing football again where people can pay to watch? Because the furlough scheme um, is is eighty percent or up to two and a half thousand pounds a month, Correct. isn't it? But does that apply to professional footballers yep. as well? Yes. Right. So obviously yourself, it's a lot more manageable than Rangers, for example. Yeah. Well, the advantage with us is that uh, none of our players are getting two thousand five hundred pound a month, so we've got the advantage of that that the eighty percent they're covered by the eighty percent. Another thing is that they're not, they whilst they'll be losing some revenue, some some revenue for themselves. Most of them have still got other jobs as well, so they may have been furloughed from the other jobs, or they may be still working. So most of Elgin's players play uh, have a have a job elsewhere. Yeah, there's only two, haven't I think? We we had a, um, an emergency board meeting, and we sat with the figures, and we worked out how much money we had, and how long we could keep on paying players. So rather than pay the players, and then when it runs out, you stop and you lose your contracts, we asked the players to go to take a two thirds reduction, so that we could pay them longer. And uh, most of the players accepted that. And then when furlough scheme in, then the 80% that, that has just continued on. So that allowed the club to function. Because there's lots of stuff that's... Well, the pitch is still being maintained. And we've got guys coming in this week to... Uh, next week, sorry, to do the overseeding. And there's other aspects of the club that still need to be maintained and still need to run. Some people have suggested football will be played behind closed doors, but that's not really going to be much good to anybody without gate receipts, is it? Correct. It's no good to us at all behind closed doors. If we start getting to have to play football behind closed doors, that means we've got to bring people under contract. We're in a difficult position at the moment because we've got nine players, 11 players, sorry, on contract after June. Most of the clubs, all their contracts are nearly out. Dumbarton, Stranraer, quite a few of the clubs are. And I don't know everybody. I know several of them because they've been discussing it. So after June, we've got to find the revenue. To, if, the, if the furlough scheme stops, we've got to find the revenue to pay those 11 players. If the furlough stops, no club is going to be signing players on the normal contract without some sort of clause in it to say that we'll not pay you once we start playing football. So once, once they bring everybody back together and start playing games, if there's no revenue stream and you've got to pay your players, it just deepens the crisis for the football clubs. Are you literally relying on the sponsorship to survive, or is there any other source of income here at Barrow Briggs? Yeah, we've got. Well, you're sitting in one of the one of the hospitality suites, and across the other side of this, directly opposite to the to the, to the west end of the ground. So we've got the hospitality suite here that takes about ninety. Next door takes about two hundred, and we do conferencing, uh, dance classes, loads of other stuff that brings in the social club. And then we've got the supporters club as well, who are very, very excellent supporters club. We've got who sponsor us and support us all the way through. It's Kieran. This is the uh, club's only paid employee at the moment. <laughs> I understand. <laughs> so the whole the whole crisis is really making making you probably for the first time having to think how you can generate money. No, we think of that every day. <laughs> it's every single day that uh, a club a club like we've got. It's every single meeting, all the first first three quarters of an hour maybe, is only just how to generate revenue. As we stand, we've got a just-giving page, 
we've been sat, had a big sale on on our kit. We're doing a scheme called Buy a Brick, which is doing really well. People are buying bricks to stick on the outside of the ground, and it looks fantastic. And all these things are a revenue stream at the moment, so it's building up. And, and as I say, we, we, we'd be okay for a period, but you know how long it would last, I don't know. How many bricks can you potentially sell? Uh, world, 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 world. <laughs> we build the Empire State Building. <laughs> just keep, if people are going to sell them, we'll find where to put them. So if you want to buy a brick at Elgin City, how much is it going to cost you, Graham? 50 quid. £50. Pound. Just £50? Pounds. Just £50. Pound. <laughs> and you can put your name on them, put your message on the front of it. Every penny helps. <laughs> every, every penny does help. What's going on in your trophy room at the moment down there? You've got shirts all over. Yeah, the no, we're selling all the, just all the kit we've got. We're just selling it off at 50% sale to try and move it so we can keep revenue coming in. I don't think we'll kick a football after Christmas. That long? Yep. Mm-hmm. I, don't, I can't see in any way on this planet we can play football with masks on and have people being tested for coronavirus after and before a game or taking temperatures. 22 guys running on a pitch with all the infrastructure that goes along with bringing a game on. And I believe some, some talk of stopping the game every 50 minutes to change a mask. And, you know, it's just a, it's an absolute farce. It might be OK at the big, at the, big the top level, up, up in the Premier League or maybe in the Scottish Premier League, where the, the television money may be able to make it affordable. But uh, if they bring back football here and we don't get a pay in public, and there's no furlough scheme, that's where we'll hit, hit the wall. Just, just going back to what you just said about players wearing masks, every single aspect of life is going to have to incorporate this, the social distances laws. There will be no rules for the big teams, rules for the smaller clubs, will there? We, we, we reckon we could get easily a normal crowd in here with social distancing. Right. I mean, the stand would the stand might be a bit difficult because obviously every lots of this is in ticket holders and gold card members have all got their own seats, so they would probably want to sit in their own seats. Well, that that would be a problem because you wouldn't get your two meters because the seats are only about six inches of each other. But the rest of the ground is no problem at all with social distancing. But it's the it's the putting on a game and having the ridiculous effect of trying to you know you, you just need one of those guys to test positive, and that's the rest of the guys in for a fortnight. Surely, once football does resume, there's going to be social distancing. Prices are going to rocket because there's going to be less people in football grounds. Could the game literally collapse? I don't think you can judge anything on what we knew before. So it's very difficult to know where we're going to go with it because I think that the, the, in the Premier League and places like that, yes, the big money will still be spent because, I mean, even now there's people talking about spending millions on players when, when, the, when they're furloughing players. So they're, they're putting their players out on furlough Yet they're talking about big money to, to buy in to buy in people, so I, I can't judge anything on what what's previously happened. What I would say that with us, with us we have we've got a, a good squad of players. We we pay a reasonable rate for a, well a pretty good rate for part time football in our division, but we're not we're not cash strapped at the moment. As long as it stays, as long as we've got an even keel with the furlough system. And when when it does come back, as long as we can get the revenue in, then we're going to keep can we can survive no problem at all. The problem will be if the furlough stops. At the top end, playing at the places like the Premier League, they'll have no problems there because the TV will pay them. Because now they've taken they've taken away the three o'clock uh, banning of uh, of games being shown at three o'clock on a Saturday, so they'll have every single Premier League game televised. We could potentially the game of football become almost a pay-per-view sport without supporters? I'd like to think you would never get this because the tribalism in this country, it, it, I, I mean, I say this country, I mean UK, it's a social event, the game of football. And that's, that's what I'm saying. It's not just watching the game outside, but we get maybe 100, 100 people, 50-odd people sitting in the pub downstairs drinking, they finish the game, they rip the game apart, and, and, and the directors usually on a Saturday after the game's finished. You know, So it's... It's um, it's all about the social aspects of the game, and I don't think sitting at home and watching the game on TV is exactly the same. You know, you might get the pubs for, uh, have a lot of people in them if they show them live. But that's another thing. I mean, we we can't afford to show Sky games here live because it costs seven hundred nine quid or five hundred nine quid a month to to do that. We played a game against Rangers, and we, it gave us about probably two two to three years worth of money. Tell us what that was like um, having Rangers play here. It was awesome. 
You know, it was. I mean, we, we sold four thousand tickets. You know, it was fantastic, and the ground was packed. It wasn't one ounce of trouble. Not one ounce of trouble. One guy got taken out for for being a little bit over the top because he'd been inebriated, probably in a local pub. <laughs> so you imagine that that four thousand people coming to Elgin. There was a lot of Elgin supporters. Sorry, a lot of Elgin people who were supporting Rangers. So it was maybe a thousand, fifteen hundred Elgin supporters, but the rest of them some made it were Rangers supporters. You couldn't tie the difference because it was just a fantastic atmosphere. No better. And the the way that the the took us on, the way Rangers dealt with us was just tremendous. There's no, no part of me thinks for one minute that it can be good to lose a club the size of Glasgow Correct. Rangers right. from the structure of Scottish football. Can it? I think they made a huge, I think the Premier League when they voted to put them out made a huge error in judgement. They should have given them a, a points fine and let them uh, stay with them because <clears> then, if you remember, they missed, they missed one of the promotions. They thought they'd get back within three years and they missed one. Didn't Hibs got promoted instead, I think? So they missed one of the promotions so it was another year out. But there's still there's still problems at that football club. Obviously, they've got to recover from that, and it just it just shows you how difficult it is to recover when a club of that stature. But I think when they played us, they they still bought. I think it was Templeman from Hearts. For, I don't know how much he was getting a week, but they bought him. They could have beaten us with their 19 side. Mm. I mean, they were they were a great side. They were really good. They didn't have to bring in all the extra players that they brought in. They could have just continued with. And but they've got to appease a lot of fan, fanatical support. Absolutely fanatical support, and they've got to appease those. So they've got to, they've got to keep on trying, and that's what all this is about with Hearts and with the, with everything else is the Celtic and nine in a row. You know they've got to, they've got to be seen to making sure that they can stop that happening if possible. You can't believe the, the support that the supporters were so chuffed just to find a league they could play in because until we voted them into the league, they were finished. They had nowhere to play football, so they had to apply to join the third division exactly the same as we did when we applied to join the third division and that meant that some clubs that would have normally joined the third division didn't get in like you know like Cove tried for years to get in the, in the third division and, and the Spartans have tried but Rangers obviously it was a no brainer to accept them in because it was it was a tremendous experience for all the clubs all the clubs did well out of it I mean we played we had four good games against them you know we had the, the league games and we had a cup game how, how did you fare against them in those four games? Yeah, uh, we did all right. We drew one and got beaten the others, but you know, you you just—it's the experience. Well, what, what were they? Fantastic. What were they like? Did you feel that it was a big a big machine here? They had the security officers, two security officers. They arrived with a bus that filled the street practically. You know, a massive, great big bus. The beds in the back, the physio stable, everything. Just—I mean, it was just a different level. Hmm. When you're down south, you're spoilt because you. you it's, I want to say, I say England. And these Premier League clubs, they all travel, like, they all do that. Whereas in this country, in Scotland, it's probably only Rangers and Celtic who travel like that, you know. But it's it's a fantastic setup when they arrive. You know, the guys arrive hours before, they have all the kit in, all the players arrive, you know. And it's just it was just fantastic watching it. Then the experience, I mean, Ali McCoy, Walter Smith were tremendous, they were great. And the good thing was that they all stayed behind because they knew what it meant to the local support. So they all signed autographs and stayed and you know hung around after a little bit for the game and that sort of thing. It was absolutely fantastic. No, com- It was just, just brilliant. I just wish they could have stayed for another couple of seasons. <laughs> yeah. what, was your, what was your experience like over at Ibrox? I mean, it's once in a lifetime. Isn't Ibrox, it, really? fantastic. Duff, back onto Gunn. Played back through. They just wanted offside. And Jimmy Duff with a finish. A cracking finish into the top corner. And Elgin City are ahead at Ibrox. Well, the corner was overhead. He just kept it in. The whole ball wasn't out. Got the one-two. Looked to be just offside. Jimmy Duff. But when it came back to him, what a finish into the top corner. What I found with Ibrox, it was at half time. My boardroom, you've got time to sit and talk to people because it's maybe 10, 20 people in there. The Rangers game was it was bedlam, but but it, it, normally you've got plenty of room. You can stand and talk to the directors. You couldn't do that. You got all the sponsors, I suppose. Well, the Rangers, the, and then you got lots and lots of ex players: Hately, Johnson, and Sonny Jordan. You know, the first thing went upstairs. He showed us all the trophy room. I mean, gee, was trophy room Whoa. Mm. like walking the Bank of England. This Saturday would have been Elgin's final game of the season away to Cowdenbeath. Yep. 
Um, and you were finishing the season like the proverbial freight train with seven wins from the seven previous nine. Yeah. Seven, oh, one? seven nine. I thought seven would be it. Something like that. When coronavirus stopped play, uh, how, how do you think Gavin turned an average season um, into what was potentially a promotion winning season? I think you've got to, it, it. It goes back to the, we're making basic errors. Defensively, we're making some basic errors, and then losing Shane for a period of time, stop scoring goals for a while. But uh, once once we tightened up and started playing a system that Gavin was happy with, the two wide players, or at least one wide player all the time, often two against Cove when we beat them three 0 we had two wide players, and then we brought a young kid from uh, Dundee, Dundee United called Ross Graham. He tightened things up. He was he was solid as a rock, um, and it just tightened up. And the main th- the good thing is as well, Thomas Thomas was excellent. Thomas settled in. He, maybe I don't know whether he was nervous. He's full of, he's actually chock a block full of confidence. But then he, you know, he just, just he made some wonderful saves. But I mean, he's been outstanding, and I think that's it just we just we just became a good solid unit, really solid, and uh, they, we were of the form team going mm. to the playoffs. Although Queens Park and Cowden Beath were still hard to beat, you know, Cowden Beath would be a bit sick that they didn't end up third, because Edinburgh got away with it. I mean, we played good games against Edinburgh. You know, we should have beaten Edinburgh a lot more than we did. So we couldn't catch Edinburgh. I don't think we no. could, well, we couldn't have caught Cove anyway. Fantastic achievement, actually, to come out of the Highland League. And was it the nucleus of the same team that had come up? And they just built on that? Yeah, I, I, it was a good side when they came up. I mean, they were, they were playing. Megginson's a tremendous player. You know, really good. Their defence might not be the greatest defence in the world, but when you're scoring that many goals, you don't have to worry about it. And I think, I think they'd been trying for years, when we were, when we were trying to get in the league, um, the guy, Alan McCrea, who was the chairman of Cove, eventually became the president of the SFA. And I think it was one of his big, big dreams eventually to get Cove into the SPFL, which was achieved just, actually just as he'd retired. Cove got promoted that year. And they deserved it. I mean, they've got a really good setup and um, they might not have the best sort of ground to play in. It's in the back of a, a factory estate, but they've got a good setup and a good manager, you know. And they had a good manager when they were in the Sheerings, a good, uh, you know, they had a good setup, and uh, you know they deserve to be promoted. And uh, uh, more strength at their elbow that they've bought into the fourteen, fourteen, fourteen. But the way you finished the season, uh, is that momentum that you can take into next season? Well, and possibly. Into- that's where we made one mistake. Well, that's, that's unfair. Not a mistake. That's where we start a plan for the next season when we we signed nine of that. Uh, we've got eleven of that squad signed. So the only one we leave, we're the only really player that we're concerned about losing was Shane. So Shane signed a pre-contract with, Co- with uh, Inverness Cali Thistle. So he's going through there. But the rest of them, we've tried to retain everybody. You know, there's one or two that are still outstanding. Uh, uh, Bronski, um, O'Keefe and a couple of others. In fact, Bronski was due to come up on that Saturday to sign when the game was cancelled, so he didn't come. So Stephen Bronski will get, get him back in as soon as we can. But the problem is now, we can't afford to go and sign these players because we could be left with in a state where we're going to prepare them and we you know, we just can't afford to take them on at the moment. What's your best memory of, would it be the Rangers game? No, winning the league. Winning the league. Winning the league and losing it. Winning it on a, on a Friday night and lost it on a Tuesday.
was fantastic, absolutely brilliant. Had a great team, absolutely brilliant team. Had a midfield to die for: Michael Teasdale, Russell Mackay, Sophie Cameron, John Teasdale, Willie Furphy. Just fantastic. Craig Hinchcliffe went on to play for Scottish League. Just a tremendous setup. It was just a great, an absolutely wonderful night. Every three days we've been filling the two big black tanks behind the Gleaner sign. And uh, we've been filling them with so we can sp we spray this now with every night at nine o'clock the water comes, we put the spray on, the sprinklers on. Bitch is looking good that. Ah, it's it's looking good, but if you look it's there's plenty of that all over it. But we'll get it it's getting done next week, we'll get it seeded and then get the get some growth into it. Just looking around the ground, a lot of lot of sponsorship there. Any sponsors come showing any concerns at the moment? We normally don't put out the, the invoices until June. So we're just giving as much time as we can. McDonald Monroe, they're, they're really, they've been a fantastic sponsor. I mean, I could switch the lights on. If you notice, you've got lights when you walk in, the lights come on as you walk in and all that sort of thing. done all that for us. And we just put a great huge shed there and the electrics for that for me. For the tractors and uh, the tractors and the lawnmower. Because, I mean, we've invested 60 grand in the tractors and lawnmowers. And they're, they're sitting outside all the time. So we decided to build a shed. Can we just take a look at the changing rooms while we're here? Yeah, of course you can. Oh, it was actually bigger than I expected. Yeah, it's probably, apart from Queen's Park, it's probably one of the biggest ones in our league, certainly in our league and many other leagues as well.